In this subunit, I'll explain a little bit, or I'll try to explain, this mystery about how it is that such different functions can have similar bifurcation diagrams and the exact same value for delta. How is it that in one-dimensional functions, delta equals 4.669201 and on and on is a universal value, the same for any function that maps an interval to itself and has a single quadratic maximum? I'm not going to be able to present um, anything close to a rigorous argument. The math is quite involved and beyond the level of this course, but I think I can give at least a picture or a sketch of some of the ideas involved. Let's give it a shot anyway. So the mathematical technique that's used is something called renormalization. And renormalization is a procedure where one rescales an object or a function and sees how and if that function changes. So let me illustrate this with some geometric examples. So first, here's a curve. And to renormalize it, a renormalization procedure might be to zoom in on it. And that has the effect of scaling it up. So here it is, and I might zoom in. So there it is zoomed in. So this is renormalization. So maybe from here to here would be one renormalization. And then I could ask, what if I do another renormalization and then another? What happens to this shape? And as I argued before, when we were talking about derivatives a long time ago and in a different context, if you renormalize this curve, it looks more and more like a straight line. So let me just illustrate that once more. Here's the curve. I renormalize it, it's getting larger and larger, and I'm achieving that by moving it closer and closer to the camera. And it looks, okay, not exactly like a straight line, but hopefully quite a bit like a straight line. Okay, here's another shape. This is a line. I meant it to be straight, it's not quite straight, but um, this is a line. We can renormalize this, change the scale, zoom in on this, and if I do that, I'm moving it closer to the camera. And I hope that what you're seeing is that when you do this, the shape doesn't change. If you zoom in on a line, so you go from here to here, again, assuming I drew this perfectly straight, if you do this, the function doesn't change. A line still looks like a line. So we can use some of the language from dynamical systems to describe this process. I would say that the line is a fixed point of the renormalization operator. So the renormalization operator, that's like the rule for the dynamical system, and it just rescales, zooms in and out. It's a fixed point because a line doesn't change. If a line is straight, you zoom in on a straight line, it's still a straight line. All right, let's use that language to think about what happens to this curve. This is not a fixed point. As you zoom in, it becomes straighter. It's not a fixed point because applying the renormalization operation, that's like the rule for the dynamical system, the function changes. The, the function we're operating on, this curve, changes. So this is not a fixed point because it doesn't stay the same when I renormalize. However, it's getting closer and closer to a straight line. So we would say that this is a fixed point and moreover, it's an attracting fixed point. It's an attracting fixed point because other curves like this one, when you apply the renormalization operation, when you zoom in, look more and more like the straight line. So we would say that this is an, a, a fixed point and an attractor of this renormalization operation. Um, let me mention uh, a, a little bit more terminology um, renormalization is sometimes referred to as the renormalization group. And the idea there is that there's a collection of transformations. We could zoom in, zoom in again, and doing two zoom ins is the same as doing one bigger zoom in. And so mathematically, that actually doesn't have the property of a group. Technically, it's a semi-group. But people call it the renormalization group anyway. So anyway, the renormalization group, renormalization group methods, just renormalization all of those refer to the same thing, looking at how some property, some system changes when you change the length scale, when you zoom in and out.
the other bit of terminology to mention is that this uh, attracting fixed point, you might we might also call a universal curve. It's a universal curve in this sense of universality because almost any curve, when renormalized, approaches a straight line. If I had a curve that had a, a, a point in it, that would not approach a straight line. But almost any um, initial condition, if you will, almost any curve, and any curve that's smooth, when you zoom in on it enough, approaches the straight line. And so we'll call this a universal curve for this simple renormalization process. So now we need to talk about how to apply the renormalization group to the logistic equation and the bifurcation diagram. So first, a little bit of uh, motivation for why we might think to apply the renormalization group in the first place. The renormalization group, the process of renormalization, is useful when there's some sort of scale-free behavior. So in the original example, this was sort of trivially scale-free. If you zoom in on a line, it keeps looking like a line. So there's something that doesn't change as the um, scale is changed. We see a similar sort of scale-free behavior in the bifurcation diagram. And in fact, that's what that number 4.669 tells us. It tells us that if you're at a given um, periodicity, the next one in the, doubling, in the doubling sequence will be 1 over 4.669 times smaller, or each one as you go in the other direction is 4.669 times larger. So that scaling, each one is about 4.7 times the previous one, that's a scaling that's constant um, as you sort of zoom in and out. You're seeing, and just visually, as you zoom in and out, you see those branches um, again and again and again at different scales as you zoom in. Um, it's a fractal, a small part of the bifurcation diagram or of the period doubling that sequence of sideways trees looks like the full part. Okay, so we suspect that there's some um, scale-free behavior, something that's not going to change under actions of some sort of renormalization. So what would we want to renormalize to see this or explore this? Okay, so this is where it gets uh, a good notch more abstract, but let me try to sketch out how this argument goes. So let's think about the transition, say, from period two to period four. So period two, that means that we have um, values of the function that return to themselves after two iterations. So that, that would be period two. So we can imagine applying the function twice to do that, but we could also imagine one function that is, um, you would call it F2, and that would be the function that applies uh, so that applies the function twice. So what, what I'm trying to say is F2 means do F twice. So this function F2 um, is just a single function that has um, F twice in it. Okay, we can do the same thing for um, the period four behavior. So when we have period four behavior, that means that there's a point that returns to itself after four iterations. So we can think about applying the function four times, or we can imagine one big function, call it f4, that achieves the same result as applying f four times in a row. So we have these two functions, f2 and f4. Okay, so the period two um, behavior, when it changes to period four behavior, that means we have a fixed point of the F2 function turning into a, a fixed point of the F4 function. And so what we're going to rescale is we're going to try rescaling or renormalizing the F2 function into the F4 function. So this is a process. The renormalization procedure ha now is more complicated than just taking a shape. Here's, an, here's this curve. Than just taking the curve and zooming it in and out. It's some stretching and rescaling and working on a function itself. So we're trying to think about what sort of rescaling would take this F2 function to F4. And that rescaling is 
our renormalization operation. Then we could apply that again, just like I could renormalize and renormalize again. So I'd apply that renormalization operation again to a function, and I'll go from an F4 function to an F8 function. So now we have, in a sense, a dynamical system that's operating on entire functions, and it's going, it's sort of taking F2 to F4, F4 to F8, F8 to uh, F16, and so on. Okay, so that act of renormalization, renormalizing these funny compound functions in a certain way, is like a dynamical system. And it turns out that that dynamical system has an attractor. And it's an, um, it's what one would call a universal function. So in the, uh, hang on, I dropped my line, excuse me. All right, there's my line again. So um, this was the attracting fixed point in the initial renormalization. And I said that this was a universal curve because other curves, when renormalized, went to this one. And that's not a very deep statement in the context of straight lines. It turns out for functions that have a single quadratic maximum and map an interval to itself, there's also a universal function that all functions that meet those criteria get pulled towards under this sort of renormalization. So I could start doing this renormalization process with a logistic equation, and I'll end up at some very complicated function. Um, somebody else could start with a cubic um, equation, and she could do renormalization, and she would end up at some very complicated compound function, but those, but those functions we end up with, we're getting closer and closer to the same function. And somebody else could start with a sine function, somebody else with another function altogether. And even though we're starting with the same function, we're ending up at the same universal function after renormalization. Okay, so I obviously haven't proved any of that, but that at least gives a flavor of what goes on in one of these renormalization calculations. So one starts with a, with a function and renormalizes and renormalizes again and sees that it's getting pulled towards this universal fixed point. This fixed point in this context is itself a function. So this universal function, this common function that all these other functions get pulled towards, um, essentially contains the information of this number 4.669. So from the renormalization calculation, you can calculate 4.669, and it turns out there are a few other numbers that are universal that characterize this universal function, and so appear in bifurcation diagrams. And it also can explain why different functions end up with, I guess, the same bifurcation diagram, but the same value for delta, 4.669201. And the reason is perhaps no more or less deep than the fact that different curves, when you renormalize them, when you zoom in, all look like a straight line. So renormalization is a type of dynamical system, and we're used to situations when we have an attractor where different initial conditions can end up at um, the same attractor. Here the initial conditions are different functions, and they end up at the same universal compound function that describes this transition from periodic behavior to chaotic behavior. So I realized that discussion was pretty abstract, but nevertheless, I hope it was useful in giving some general sense of what renormalization is and how it's used to study transitions like the period doubling route to chaos. How it can show us how um, certain features of models or functions don't matter, how all of these different functions can have the same properties um, as this uh, transition occurs. So let me conclude with just a few more comments about renormalization. Uh, it's a pretty standard technique in theoretical physics. It was originally proposed in the context of high energy physics, I think in the 60s, and then quickly found application in statistical physics as well. And it's more of the statistical physics sense of renormalization that I presented here and that arises in dynamical systems. So it's a well understood um, theoretical line of attack on a bunch of interesting problems all concerning um, some sort of transition where there's some sort of scale-free or fractal behavior. Um, it's a fairly advanced topic. It's not usually taught in undergraduate curricula that I know of, um, 
but it's not uh, incredibly or forbiddingly difficult either, I would say. In the additional reading section in this unit, I've included pointers to a handful of book chapters that I think are particularly good for getting a sense of renormalization and universality in dynamical systems more generally. In any event, renormalization techniques um, are an analytical tool, pencil and paper, or sometimes done with a computer, but not a numerical simulation type of approach. And they let one understand this phenomenon of universality, and they also allow one to calculate the so-called critical exponents, things like delta, and other features of the systems under study. So this um, explains, or at least attempts to explain, how it is that all of these different dynamical systems have the same delta. I still haven't talked about how um, it can be that these simple one-dimensional dynamical systems have something, something to say about higher dimensional systems like dripping faucets and convection rolls, and I'll try to discuss that in the next several units. And again, I won't be able to prove it, but at least give a feel or a sketch for how that occurs. So in the next section, I'll conclude, as usual, by giving an, an overview of the technical content of this unit. And then I'll conclude with a few more remarks on what universality might mean and not mean for the study of complex systems.